Welcome. My name is Kelly Bearden. I'm a classical musician turned creative entrepreneur, and this is the best platform for musicians that are looking to shape their career by thinking outside the box. Hey, Michael, thank you so much for being here today. I have been looking forward to this, I think since we met at NAMM. So I'm so stoked. It's been months in the works and I really appreciate your time. Oh, thanks. The feeling's mutual and I'm really happy to be here. So Awesome, awesome. I want to jump right in. If it's okay, we'll just kind of hit the ground running. Sure. Let's go all the way back to childhood. When did you first start playing a musical instrument? Yeah, well, I love thinking about this actually, because I remember the excitement um, when I first got to start playing the saxophone. And I had, I was one of those kids that kind of knew that I wanted to play the saxophone at a pretty young age. Um, <clears throat> my older brothers both played in band. One played trumpet, mm. the other played clarinet. Um, but I, I, I remember in elementary school listening to oldies music. And back then the saxophone was like, you know, the guitar, it got all the <laughs> solos and all that stuff. So um, I guess I was a little rock star deep inside, but <laughs> I always loved the sound of the saxophone. And so as soon as I had a chance um, in, in fourth grade to start playing it, I just, I really jumped in and never looked back. So oh, that's, <clears> awesome. <throat> that's awesome. Yeah. Did you start with lessons right away or was that just joining school band? That was just joining school band. Um, but I was lucky to have, like I said, siblings that played music. So we were always playing different things at the house, whether it was, you know, Disney's latest duet book or whatever oh, yeah. it might've been. So <laughs> all the stuff that kids, I hope still do today. Um, and, uh, yeah, just playing around, having a good time with my friends and band and just enjoying it. So a little holiday trio action, right? Oh yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it was, it was great. We were uh, a pretty musical family. So there was, nice. you know, it wasn't like I only played music in school. Um, and I didn't start private lessons until I think I was in eighth grade. Okay. Um, so up until that point, it was just kind of doing my own thing and, and, uh, listening to my band directors and all that stuff. But private lessons started in eighth grade. Um, and then I started to get more serious about it in high school. What kind of instigated that switch into private lessons for you? Or was there something in particular that brought that on? Um, I think my, my parents just recognized that I was, um, I was good at it and I really, really loved it. And so it was kind of that next step going into high school bands. I wanted to play and, you know, start auditioning for their jazz bands where I would be uh, quote unquote competing with older kids in the school, that kind of stuff. Um, so it was just, I think they recognized that it was a, a talent of mine that, um, they could see I was motivated to develop further and, and I just enjoyed it. It was one of my biggest passions in school. So, mm. and I, I had a lot of interests. I was, I like to think of myself as a fairly well-rounded person. And, um, I think I owe a lot of that to my parents growing up, letting me try a lot of different things. And so yeah, we talked about golf that, that was a big passion growing up too. Well, yeah. it was it, I, <laughs> only with my grandparents. Yeah. It ah, was fair enough. <laughs> my grand, my, uh, my grandpa liked to golf. And so I did a fair amount of golf in like nice. high school and early college just with them, but never competitively, just a kind of a fun <laughs> thing to do on the side. Yeah. And my, uh, my grandpa gave up on me pretty early. I, I think I took like a golf <laughs> class in summer school one year, which that's a whole other debacle I ended up skipping class one day and getting in trouble because I was just like that anti-golf class which is so <laughs> unlike me like anyone that knows that I was not a rule breaker um but I just found it so boring so he tried for a while and then you know when I brought Isaac around and Isaac actually liked to golf and was decent it was oh. like over the moon <laughs> so thrilled yeah, to have someone that actually cares. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh that's my funny gosh. yeah Too no funny. I would just kind of get out there and hit the ball and enjoy myself but I never had <laughs> the motivation to get better at it like I did in music or, you know, some, a few other areas, but. Nice. Yeah. yeah it, it, well, it's hard too when you're in high school and you're starting to figure out where you want to go with your career. Obviously mm -hmm. we start to specify. So you're like doubling down on music at that point. I'm sure by yeah. sophomore, junior year of high school, things were getting more serious. Mm -hmm. Outside of jazz band and school band, were there other things that you were involved in at that point? Yeah. Um, I did like recreational sports, uh, mm -hmm. basketball and, um, I guess that would have been the only recreational sport in high school, but um, I was, I had a wide range of interest in school too itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, I always loved um, history class. I loved science. So um, yeah, I, I had a, a wide variety of interests, I think, even just in school itself, although music was really my, 
my passion. And if I had to choose between, you know, this activity or music, it was mm. pretty much always going to be, be music. But. Was it a pretty easy choice then to study music going into college? It was. And, um, you know, I, I've always kind of, I don't think I thought about it much th then, but the more, the older I get and the more questions I get asked about this, I think what I was really doing was I was following something that I was passionate about, but that I was also good at. It was a, kind of that strength and passion relationship. And it, it just kind of made sense. Um, I was a little, I'd say I was a little introverted or shy um, towards the end of high school. Um, and music was also kind of a, a I don't want to say a safe place for me. I had, you know, plenty of I had friends and a good support network and all of that, but it was a comfortable place. That's a better word yeah. for, uh, for me. So um, to be able to pursue a degree in something that I was passionate about, and it also felt like home mm -hmm. um, for me, that was kind of a no, a no brainer. That makes total sense. The band mm -hmm. room kind of becomes like your, it's the hangout spot. It's not just where you go for band class or after school for activities. Right. It's where you eat lunch sometimes. You yeah. Practice. Like it becomes your, your home room for maybe lack of a better yeah. term that you're coming back to constantly. Yeah. Awesome. And I think the, the people that you meet along the way, um, and I didn't know this going into college, but yeah. it was, um, it felt great to get there and be around so many people that had similar interests. Um, and even some of the same values, you know, um, so it was um, it was a good choice and a pretty easy choice for me to to um, initially pursue music. Although I would say that the further I got into it and the more real that it got, yeah. um, it started. I started having questions about: Is this really what I want to do as a career? Hmm. Um, and, and I, like I said, I also had some other interests: history, psychology, things like that. So it's. I mean, you know how it is when you're in college you're, I don't know, 19, 20 years old, and you're expected to figure everything out and where you want to be and what you want to do. Yeah. Uh, I was no different than any other kid at that age. I, I wasn't positive. I, I liked what I was doing, but looking towards a lifetime of doing that, it, you start, I think it's normal uh, to question yourself. And that's one of the things that I like to throw out there um, to students that are now pursuing music degrees and things like that. It's okay to question. Um, yeah. But after college, though, and this was kind of a turning point for me, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to, if I wanted to pursue grad school in music um, or maybe switch up entirely. And I went and I worked on cruise ships for two years mm. uh, playing the saxophone. And so I had a couple years of cruising the world, getting paid just to play my saxophone. And I thought, this is pretty cool making a living doing something that I <laughs> legitimately enjoy. Uh, and so after that, there was really no, no looking back in terms of wanting a career in music, generally speaking. So. That's awesome. I actually had a student ask me about this a couple of weeks ago after a university presentation. They said, have you ever like met anyone that's done the cruises? And I had a, I have a friend who's a vocalist. I did that for a while. How did you get into that? Cause I mean, there's an audition process around that usually. And yeah. it's such a, it's such a niche area of performance. I think from like yeah. an outsider view, how did you figure out that was even remotely interesting to you? Well, and this is funny. This is how interested I was in music at a young age. I remember being in, I think, sixth or seventh grade and idolizing one of the, the saxophone players in the high school band. Mm. And I would get to hear him at those school concerts and my parents would take me to those just to, and I was just really idolizing him. And I found out that after high school and in college, he worked on a cruise ship. And I was like, that's something you can do. So that was something I was interested in trying even, you know, all through high school and then college. And then um, finally, after I graduated, it was kind of a realistic option. Um, mm. And I had some friends that were doing that. There were a few different agencies that um, at the time would sometimes visit college campuses or reach out to college campuses. And um, most cruise ships at that time had what they called a show band. And this was the band that would play kind of their Broadway style shows with singers and dancers and all of that kind of elaborate sets and everything in the main theater. And then we would also um, play guest entertainer acts. You might have a Motown artist that comes in or might just be a comedian that you play on 
you know, 10 minutes when they walk on and 10 minutes when they walk off. Very much kind of that, um, almost like a Tonight Show vibe mm. in those kind of instances. Um, and so I auditioned with one of these agencies and then they, uh, you know, they worked with the cruise ship companies to find where there were open seats. Um, and at that time, most ships had two saxophones, a trumpet, trombone, and a rhythm section. And so I played, over the course of two years, I did, sometimes I was the alto player, sometimes I was the tenor player. There was a lot of doubling involved, also clarinet and flute, things like that. So um, I would say my my um, emphasis on jazz through school paid off because it was more that kind of music as opposed to like classically trained musicians that would maybe not be as comfortable a fit. But, um, you know, you show up, you sight read, you rehearse, and then... You know, you rehearse an hour a day and then you play two gigs at night. And then the rest of the day, you just get to kind of hang out on a cruise ship or go into port, check it out. So it was a really great way to see the world and a cool opportunity for somebody straight out of college. I would not I would not do it today, (laughs) (laughs) but straight out of college, it was awesome. Fair enough. Fair enough. When you were trying to figure out, I'm going to back up for a second. When you're looking at your undergrad and you you know music is where you want to go, how are you making a decision? Or maybe a better framing is what factors were most important to you in the decision of where you went to school? So I mentioned I was kind of shy. So just on a personal level, I didn't want to go too far from home. Mm, Um, And so that was part of Interesting that we ended up on the cruise ships later, but that's... I know it was, yeah, no, you're right. Through music, um, I grew a lot personally and Mm. professionally. Um, I really did. And without it, I'd probably still be in my hometown and, you know, enjoying life, hopefully, but not to the same, you know, degree or the same way I am now. But um, so I wanted to be kind of close to home um, and I wanted to have a great saxophone teacher um, that could also perform um, and... Uh, I was really mostly interested. I didn't. I wasn't really thinking about what am I going to do with this music degree. It was more okay. I can get a scholarship to go into something I really like to do. I'll mm-hmm. figure out exactly what I'll do with it later. Um, so I wanted to go to a school where I could do some jazz stuff um, with a great teacher, not too far from home. And I found that um, at Millican University, um, and uh, really great teacher who became my my mentor on the saxophone, Perry Rask. Um, And I did a lot of classical and jazz study. So it was just really, even though I wasn't a performance major, I was a commercial music major, which was kind of their way to get more jazz stuff into the curriculum. Um, But his focus was, his philosophy, which became mine later on, was I'm not going to teach you jazz. I'm not going to teach you classical. I'm going to teach you the saxophone. And if you learn that the right way, you're going to be able to do either one. So we did a lot of of both, obviously a lot of fundamental work, but a lot of classical repertoire and a lot of jazz um, studies. So um, it for me, it was all about the teacher. And I remember auditioning at several schools and there were a lot of great teachers, um, some of whom I became you know friends with later on. Uh, but Perry, uh, the combination of energy and just passion, that was a great, great fit for me. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. It, so it, it feels like this program, I, I'm curious about commercial music. It feels like this program gave you a lot of license to figure out your own path, especially, I mean, in saxophone, where there is a lot more mm-hmm. <laughs> available to you sure. genre-wise, which is awesome. Yeah. It, I'm wondering what classes were involved in that. Was it all still performance focused when we're saying commercial music? Or did that mean also some music business was tied yeah. in there? There was, there was a, it was kind of a combination of, um, obviously there were all the core music classes, of course, um, but not the education classes like methods classes and things like that. But the music, classical music theory, all of that stuff was, was there. Um, there was some recording studio, um, pieces to it, which to me, ironically, it, it, that wasn't actually that interesting to me, although there was a great Um, staff and great teachers and a lot of people that were really into it great facilities Um, that's for to be honest that's why most people chose a commercial music degree at Mm. Millican was because of the recording studio side Um, and then there was the kind of the the uh, music business side which was a few classes but after your first two years you could kind of 
um, pick a track within commercial music. And one of those tracks was um, jazz studies. So there were more okay. advanced classes on you know, improvisation, jazz composition, um, things like that. So that was really what I was keeping my eye on through those first two years um, while getting a nice, well-rounded education in, in the rest of it. So That's awesome. And I Is would also we... say Millican was very, um, in comparison to some other schools, fairly heavy on the gen ed side. Mm. So there were a lot of, um, you know, other non-music classes that I was required to take, which at the time maybe bothered me a little bit, like it does, I think, everybody. But looking back, a, some of that really helped to prepare me for the career I ended up, you know, landing in, uh, in yeah. music business. So what courses in particular do you feel like were the most impactful? Great question. Um, for me, a lot of the writing classes, hmm. um, a lot of the writing classes, because I feel like sometimes that's something that, um, if you only go to one through one degree, which I, you know, was crazy enough to go through three, um, it's easy to kind of gloss over that, but there's a lot of written, um, you know, responsibilities in my position now. Um, one class that I wish I would have paid a little bit more attention to would have been communications mm. classes, um, because that is an enormous part of my job and really anybody's job, honestly. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say those were the ones that really, um, I think, long-term benefited me in, in ways that maybe I didn't quite appreciate at the time. That makes total so. sense. You know, it's funny that you mentioned communications. When I was looking at my undergrad, my professor, Todd Levy, the summer before we were talking about planning and career planning and everything and mm -hmm. trying to figure all the courses fit together. And I remember a phone call. I don't know why I remember this so vividly. It was like a Thursday at like 7 30, 8 o'clock at night. And he called me and said, I want you to talk to this other student who's graduating because she managed to fit in a communications minor in her music degree. And I think mm. that would be really good for you, like just based on things that we've been talking about. So he got me in contact with her and then somehow I also ended up in contact with her mom and her mom had kind of helped her plan everything out. So she was kind of helping me do that. So I ended up with a minor in communications and in political science, and that was more interest-based. But those classes, I think sometimes were also a really nice reprieve from sure. the music classes where it can yeah. get so heady and you're so on one track that, yes. you know, I'm, I'm also picturing you and your history classes feeling the same way. Like it's so yeah. nice to, to have something else that you're mm -hmm. thinking about for a while. Well, and it kind of, I think in a way it, it anchors you to your previous self a little bit. Like you grow yeah. up going through school as a kid and you're expected to do a, a wide variety of things and and then you find this one thing that you're passionate about and you dive all in and that's great. But I do think it's important to be able to step outside of that and remember that you're more than just this one thing, mm. you know? Um, I yeah. think that there's a lot of good that can come from that. And it's, I, I mean, for me at least at times it, it was hard to remember that, you know, kind of hard to yeah. remember who was I before I was so serious about this one thing. But. That makes total sense. Well, especially because I think as musicians, we have so much passion and drive that could mm -hmm. absolutely be applied to anything else that we're doing in life. Yes. And I really think yeah. for most musicians, if they end up in music, they're going to be successful. If they end up in law, which is another path that I've seen a lot of colleagues go down post undergrad, yep. I think they're going to be successful there. So it, it, it is yes. interesting to see that uh, work ethic that comes from practicing diligently for years before you even get to school really kick in no matter what you're mm -hmm. doing. Totally agree. Yeah. Do you find that in your current work, I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit, do you find that that musical background is a positive in your coworkers and other people that you're in contact with in the working style? Do you feel like it aligns pretty well because everyone's coming from that similar experience? Um, I'm not sure I totally understand your, your question. That's totally fine. I can rephrase slightly, and then okay. if this is not landing, we can absolutely skip it too. Not a big sure. deal. Um, I think what I'm picturing is since a lot of our musician friends and colleagues in your current working environment mm. have this history of, of decades, possibly, of practicing and, and being so diligent, I'm wondering if that means for the artists that you're working with or even just people that are in your office, mm -hmm. if that kind of work ethic transfers into the office and maybe the communication style is more aligned or people are coming to things with a similar background. And if that's not the case, 
Yeah. That makes sense too. Everyone's still different, but I don't know if it creates commonalities. No, I, I love that question now that I understand it a little bit better. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do think, um, and one of the interesting things about the company I work for, and um, people know us as Van Doren USA, we're the importer and distributor of Van Doren products here in the US, um, but the actual name of the company is Danzer. Um, there are a lot of musicians in this company, our whole marketing staff, musicians, most of our sales staff, musicians, um, and really clarinet or saxophone players. Um, but then <laughs> we also why. have, yeah, <laughs> but we also have, um, you know, accountants, we have um, warehouse workers, um, you know, there's, it's that maybe they don't have a musical background or they did when they were kids and they appreciate it. And so we can connect on mm. On that level, one of the beautiful things I think about music um, is that in our pursuits um, over the years, you meet so many different kinds of people. And I think if we're doing it right and we're staying open minded, which is not always easy to do, um, you're able to connect with almost anyone, you know, especially if you remember, like we were saying before, that at least at some point in life, we had interests other than music. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of commonalities that we can find with each other, even outside of music. But, um, but I do think that especially for us musicians, there is kind of that camaraderie of we've all been through this. Uh, we understand. And uh, that's cool. That's a, that's a neat feeling. And then when you step outside of Danzer and, you know, start talking about our artists and our BACs, artist clinicians, uh, or working with educators, I think having a background as a musician is tremendously valuable um, because we understand, you know, we're not just selling reads. Um, we're creating educational content because we want to help them with what they're doing and what the challenges that they're, they're facing. And we do understand what they're going through. We're not just a company, you know, we're a company of musicians that understands kind of their journey. That makes total sense. And I'm yeah. sure it improves the relationships especially when we're talking about educators, if you're providing mm -hmm. resources to them that are coming from a very informed place, <laughs> yes, it yeah. saves them time and energy, which Absolutely. music education, they have a lot on their plate these days. Yeah. And that's our, that's our hope. I mean, we, uh, that's yeah. really kind of central to our entire marketing approach is just helping educators, um, you know, with whatever they need help with, um, you know, to whatever degree that we can, mm. because if it's good right. for them, it's good for us, it's good for the students. It really is. There's so many situations in this business where it's a win, win, win. Um, and so those are kind of the places we try to pursue. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I want to talk about how we landed at this job. So I'm going to back up a little bit because we haven't talked about a master's program yet. So let's sure. take that quick sidestep. Yeah. Post cruise, what came next? So after that, um, I went to DePaul University in Chicago to uh, where I did my uh, master's in jazz saxophone performance, studied with the great late Mark Colby, who um, I really credit Mark to kind of teaching me how to be a working musician uh, mm -hmm. in a big city. So it was neat. You know, my undergrad was at a, a smaller school. Then I get some real world life experience out on cruise ships, if, if you can call cruise ships <laughs> the real world. <laughs> that might be a stretch. A separated. <laughs> yeah, different world. Uh, and then... Uh, and then I got to experience being a musician in a big city. And, and that's really, I think a lot of those city schools, that's kind of what it's about. People go there for the city. Um, but with Mark, you know, he had been there for so many years and done everything. Um, he really, he immediately identified the areas that I needed to improve on to start getting, you know, gigs in Chicago and getting calls. And uh, which the first thing was, you got to learn more tunes. I remember him telling me that. You don't know this tune? Okay, you got to learn it. But he always did it. There was never um, a condescending tone. And there was so much I didn't know. And it's really mm -hmm. easy. We've all had probably teachers or encountered somebody that just looks at you like, how could you not know that? And you feel about this big. Mm -hmm. That was not Mark. He's just like, oh, you don't know? Okay, well, let's dive in. And I loved That's that awesome. and um, appreciated that so much. But um, so that was kind of my... DePaul experience, really um, learning what kind of what that was about. Mm. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, you know, 
playing in the bands there, and it, it was a great experience. That getting that taste of city life for a jazz musician. <laughs> but I'm not really a huge city person, so after that, um, and I was Chicago's ready to, a big one. That's a yeah, problem. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a big one. It's a big one. So I had my two years. I really enjoyed it, and I learned a ton. And maybe more importantly, I met a lot of great people uh, mm-hmm. and made made a lot of friends that. Um, more and more I'm realizing how important that is for musicians. It's it's so easy. And this would really kind of be one of my biggest pieces of advice to music students is don't underestimate the social um, aspect of your music education and your college experience because you're probably going to, you don't know it, but you're going to be working with these people in some fashion at some point in your life. Um, and just not only that, but you know, from a personal growth standpoint, you have so much to learn from your friends and so much enjoyment. Um, It'll make it more fun for you and you'll be a better person for it in the end, which is going to translate in a wide variety of ways towards your, you know, professional success down the road. So um, a lot of great people in Chicago, but I was ready to get out. (laughs) (laughs) Fair enough. I want to, I want to stick with this point for a second because I love, I love what you just said. And a piece of advice that I've shared recently in a university presentation, I think that's that same, that same example, mm. was friend everyone on Facebook. Like even if you don't know them, just friend them on Facebook, add them on Instagram, whatever you're using these days, and just start liking their stuff. And I think it's mm. easy for a lot of us to feel that competition sink in, especially when we're in school and we are mm-hmm. genuinely competing for the same chair placements and the same sure. opportunities. It is a pretty tight knit group, and so we're crossing paths constantly. But when you get into the professional world, like that has to get moved to the side because it's not the same opportunities every time. Sure, there's limitations to what is available to all of us, but also that's who's calling you in for a sub gig. Yeah. That's who's you know calling you in for an opportunity that they can't take. That's who's hiring you for their next project. You want those connections. So yeah. I know a lot of us have mixed feelings on social media, but I'm curious to hear if this has been impactful as you're talking about working with people post post grad, have you worked with people or hired people or um, listed jobs or anything on your social media? I might already know the answer to this one. <laughs> uh, in in recent years, that yeah. you know you're you're reaching out to those people that you kind of stayed in contact with loosely through socials. Oh yeah, absolutely, and that's one of the positive things to social media is that it is a a relatively convenient and easy way to stay in touch, even if it's just distantly in touch. Um, yeah. And yes, I've, I've hired people both for my own personal gigs or, and I've been hired for other people's projects just because probably they still saw me on social media or I still saw them um, <laughs> here at Danzer. Um, you know, I've stayed in touch with some of those people through social media and maybe they've later become artists or artist clinicians. Um, we've, I mean, I've discovered that, Posting job openings on on social media uh, is a great way to get a very diverse pool of applicants, which can be great uh, with a variety of strengths and backgrounds. So, oh yeah, no, it's it's a thing. Social media can be used for good. <laughs> Sometimes it we need that reminder. Can be. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. have to be a negative, right. negative, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. little like quicksand pit. Bringing yep. us all down all the time. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So master's program, signing to get out of Chicago, where to next in this career journey? Yeah. And then I, um, from there, I went to the University of Illinois here in Champaign, Urbana. And that was for my doctorate in jazz uh, saxophone performance. So, um, and while I was there, I got a, a lot of great teaching experience. I was the split, they call it their split TA. So I, mm. Um, was a TA on the jazz side where I would teach lessons and run ensembles um, to undergrads and some grad students. And then um, I was also a TA on the classical side um, under Deborah Richtmeyer. And so I would teach some of the music education majors their saxophone lessons. Um, And actually some of the grad students from that classical studio, I would teach some jazz lessons. So Mm. um, I got just this tremendous amount of uh, varied teaching experience, which is really important, I think, for saxophonists in particular, especially if you're looking to go on to teach at the college level, which at the time 
that was what my um, sights were set on. So mm. being able to do well both um, styles or both sides of the horn well um, is somewhat rare, and it was a, a strength of mine. And I was really fortunate to get to actually get some hands-on teaching experience at the college level doing that, um, which was awesome. Uh, so fast forward to the end of that, unless you want me to stay where I'm at here. No, but... no, you're good. That's perfect. <laughs> so um, I did. So that was basically two years of coursework. Uh, and then one year working on my project. I wanted to knock this bad boy out as fast as I could. So <laughs> I did my dissertation on uh, Paul Desmond and his improvisations on a particular album called Two of a Mind with a great baritone saxophone player, Jerry Mulligan. And while I was working on that and wrapping that up, I was like, okay, this is about to get real. I got to get a job, mm. you know? <laughs> It's and, time. Um, yeah. And I was starting. <laughs> there are only to... so many degrees we can get. We exactly. Get the next step. <laughs> exactly. And I was starting to ap apply to college jobs and, and things were going well. Um, but, you know, you got to take care of yourself in the short term as well. So um, I had a friend, again, the importance of connections, who I knew from my undergraduate at graduate degree um, that was working part time for a dancer hmm. in artist relations. And basically, he was fulfilling the orders that our artists from across the country uh, would need. If somebody needed 10 boxes of reeds, he entered it, shipped it, that kind of thing. And he was moving away. So he said, well, I could put a good word in for you here. So I said, that sounds great. That sounds like a perfect like temporary gig uh, while I'm looking for you know college jobs. So I started doing that at, at Danzer. I was just maybe 20 hours a week or something artist orders, still teaching and, and playing on the side, teaching a number of jazz um, ensembles at a local high school, and then just gigging and some private lessons and things like that. So I was just making it work like a lot of freelance uh, musicians do, and it's very happy. Um, but pretty quickly, some opportunities started to open up, and I, um, I think I was, I'm glad that I was open-minded enough to see them and take advantage of them. Um, that's kind of my other big recommendation that I throw out there to people is, yes, you're going to be dive into your passion um, full force, but don't forget to kind of look around every now and then and keep your mm. eyes open to some other opportunities that could be really cool because what we're learning in music school translates to so many different areas in and outside of music. So um, Pretty quickly, some people uh, moved out of the company, moved on to other things. And so some doors opened um, inside the company. And then before long, it was just kind of a dream dream come true. Uh, landed a, what you know has turned out to be an incredible gig at a great company um, in an area of the, the state and country that I really like. Um, and they one of the things that was really important to me was, you know, obviously I went through three degrees with the idea of being a college professor, um, I couldn't work for a company that didn't value that experience. Yeah. That just, I had put too much hard work into, you know, doing that. Um, but to this day, uh, they value all of that experience and they understand because it's a company of musicians, they understand um, how that, you know, can apply uh, to this business and, you know, all the good that can come from that. So that was really important to me. I feel like, um, you know, to be valued for my prior experience, not just, you know, that I can do this job. It was, it was more than that to them. So um, that made it a pretty easy decision too to kind of change, kind of change paths just a little bit. Yeah. I do want to talk about what it means to be an artist relation. So if you could give like a, obviously your, your full job title and like a brief synopsis of what that means and what your working sure. life looks like on a, on a regular basis. I think that would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I can do that. So I'm the director of marketing um, for Danzer. Now we, for the most part, that means Van Doren. We do have some other brands that we distribute, um, but um, Van Doren is the big one. And so basically I kind of oversee and implement um, at some level, all of our, marketing efforts and endeavors. And I'm in charge of the marketing team. Um, the president of our company is also heavily involved because um, he's always kind of been the marketing guy. He's just this incredible creative mind and um, started the company. Um, so he and I 
kind of do this together in a sense, but I manage directly the marketing team. Um, we've got a social media um, guru. We've got um, a designer and videographer. And then we have another person uh, here in Champaign who manages our uh, the day-to-day of our v- uh, Van Doren Artist Clinician Program and also takes care of the artist orders and all of that kind of artist fulfillment stuff. Um, so we all work together on a variety of projects, um, and I'm kind of serve as project manager on, on most of, of those. Um, so that's part of my job. Um, we also have uh, advisory studios in Chicago, L.A., and New York. So I, I work with them um, to make sure that all of our kind of goals are um, are kind of in place and um, we have a good plan. Now, our director of artist relations, David Gould, he's based in New York, so he he really kind of manages that more more closely. But he and I work together to kind of put those plans in place. Um, so it's kind of artist relations is part of my job in that sense. Between um, especially the artist clinician program, I'm quite heavily involved in that, um, and that could be everything from signing new people um, to you know, outlining the goals of the year, um, the direction of the program, kind of those, those things. So that's, that's really my level of artist relations. David, um, handles the, the other artist program, which is our, our biggest artist program. And that's more of a traditional artist relations kind of, uh, role. But, um, yeah. And then there's some, you know, traditional marketing and, and, sales stuff where I'll work with the head of sales and uh, VP of sales to uh, B2B marketing strategies and ideas. Um, but most of our, most of our marketing approach is actually B2C. So uh, business mm-hmm. to consumer rather than business to business. And that's um, primarily what we'll do is we'll reach out to consumers knowing that we're pulling them through our, our dealer network, uh, which has been kind of, um, that's one of the reasons that we're so education focused. Uh, you know, we know that that's a strategy that works and is helpful to, um, to everybody, the dealer, the teacher, the student, and then in the end dancer. So that makes total sense. Yeah. I know a question you probably get all the time and artist relations is, is part of your department, but not, not your main gig. Right. Um, I'm sure you get asked all the time, how do you become a Van Dorn artist or a Van Dorn artist clinician? Yeah. What is that process? How do you guys select people? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And it's a little bit different for each program. So, and maybe I'll, I'll give a, a broad overview of each program and that may, it might make a little bit more sense. So I'll start with the artist clinician program because that's the one I'm, I'm more involved with on a day-to-day basis. So this is a program, it's essentially our educational outreach program. So we pay um, artist clinicians to go out and provide free educational clinics um, to middle schools and high schools primarily. So this is really serving our core market. Uh, some college clinics, but a lot of that is focused on um, band, uh, methods classes and music education. So it's still kind of in the wheelhouse of that core market. And what they'll do is they'll go in and the first things first, they try and find out from the teacher, uh, what do your students and what do you need the most help with? Because that's what we want to start with. So typically it's just fundamental stuff, which you would expect. Um, They'll go in, they'll work with the students on, you know, anything from posture to air support to technique, phrasing, things like that. And then on the back end, uh, we equip them with, products. So the students, not to sell, we don't sell at these clinics. That's not the point. It's just to kind of show through an educational lens how quality product can play a role in your musical development. Because we all had a teacher at some point that said, that mouthpiece isn't working for you anymore, or that reed's broken in half. Maybe you should put a new one on. (laughs) Imagine so, that, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's kind of... Did I have that of... conversation on Tuesday of this week? Maybe I... <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> the never-ending struggle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's where we see kind of our place to help. Yeah. Um, and it's been a really impactful program. We have about almost 40 artist clinicians nationwide. 
uh, and we'll do, you know, hundreds of free clinics a year. Um, and it's been, it's been going really, really well. So that's the program I'm most involved with. And for that, um, a lot of it, because we're paying these clinicians to do these clinics so that the school doesn't have to, it, you know, obviously it costs some money. So we have to be, um, kind of, we're not able to add as many artists. We have to kind of pick our, our places and see where can, where can we help the most? Um, and a lot of those, uh, the people that we've signed, they'll reach out to us and we'll just kind of take time to get to know each other and see, is, is this a good fit to work together or is there maybe a different way we should work together? Um, or oftentimes artist clinicians will recommend somebody that they know in a certain area. So some of it's just kind of word of mouth and, and getting to know each other. Um, the, the artist program is, I would say, and David might describe this a little differently. I'll, I'll just put that out there. So Fair sorry, enough. David, if you see this <laughs> and I don't quite nail it, but, um, I, it's, it's a little bit more of a, a traditional, um, artist relations program where we're supporting the artist and their kind of their, um, natural endeavors, you know, we're supporting what they're doing. We're not asking them to um, go out and do this many clinics mm. um, in exchange for, for this. It's more about, well, what are you doing? And we're going to help you wherever we can. So in terms of product or occasional financial support for travel or um, clinics and, and things like that. But that tends to be geared more towards college and above. So that, in my mind, that is kind of the bigger difference. The VAC program is serving middle schools, high schools. And then the artist program is really more about um, kind of college and above um, and that it, more advanced um, music market, I guess you could say. Um, and for that, to if you're, you know, if people are interested in becoming an artist, reach out to me or David. And then it's just kind of a getting to know you process over time to see, you know, what we can do, how we can work together, because it's not as structured as the VAC program. So um, there's a lot more flexibility in that program, I would say. Um, so it just takes a little time to make sure that, um, you know, that it's a good fit for both sides because that ultimately is what we want. So when I see posts on social media, like tagging Van Doren USA in their stories saying like, sponsor me Van Doren or like any of those, oh, yeah. that's not really getting your attention very often, is it? <laughs> uh, not, for, not for potential <laughs> artists necessarily, although it certainly doesn't hurt. <laughs> um, but your best bet is to get in touch more directly. Um, nice. we do have people that will message us and, and hmm. say, how do I get in touch with, uh, you know, so-and-so to talk about the artist program. Um, but as you can imagine, we get a lot of requests. So we have to be, um, pretty, you know, pretty particular, um, about who, uh, who we're able to add and, and when and where. So, um, but, uh, Yeah. I think a lot of musicians have this idea, especially if they're instructors, like especially at the college level, if their teachers had a deal with a manufacturer or with a reed company, usually it's, you know, I'm a buffet artist. I'm a summer artist for us clarinet folks. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm a Van Doren player. When you see those kind of sponsorships, I, I wonder sometimes if that becomes an expectation for people like, oh, my teacher was this. I should also become this, like it's a natural part of the progression. Do you feel like you guys get a lot of requests? I don't mean to say this in a negative way, but do you think you get a lot of premature requests? Like we'd love to start working with you guys as soon as possible. Maybe that's a request that you make once you're a little bit more established in your career. Would you say that's fair? Maybe I'm trying to save you guys a couple of inquiries right now for like screaming from yeah. the workshops. Anyone can email Michael. <laughs> Maybe that's not the case. <laughs> I Yeah, it's... um we do get sometimes people that maybe they're, they'll be in a better place in five years or yeah, sure. 10 years or something like that. But at the same time, we always enjoy talking with people mm -hmm. um, and kind of explaining what the deal is, because I know it's, you know, it's, it's something that people are becoming more and more aware of because of social media. Um, yeah. And so uh, sometimes we found people that um, maybe they're, they, they ask about this particular program, but they're a better fit for the other program. Mm. Um, or even if, even if it's not an artist thing, there's some other ways that we can maybe help them or their, or their students or something like that. So it never hurts. And you're certainly not going to annoy us. Um, 
But uh, generally, you know, sometimes we'll get requests from like high school players or something like that. And to those students, I would say we love the passion and the guts that it takes to reach out. I would have never had the guts to reach out uh, like that. So I, when I see Same. that, I'm like, hey, we got a go-getter here. That's great. Um, but my advice to them would be continue working on, uh, you know, what you're doing. Enjoy it. Um, and then, you know, keep in touch through college, after college. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see see where things go. But it's, it is kind of a, there's no formal way of becoming an artist necessarily. It's just... It's really um, built on relationships and kind of getting a feel for each other and, and discovering, is this really a, a good fit? Mm -hmm. Is it, are we meeting the expectations of both sides here? That kind of thing. So Totally fair. Totally fair. Maybe winning like a top 25 orchestra position is a little different than you're in, oh, yeah. than you're in good shape, but uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> good, good yeah. to put a little asterisk on it. Awesome. Yeah, sure, sure. Right now, as you are looking back on your career as we're kind of reflecting on whole today. Yeah. You've given some really good advice so far, which I really, really appreciate. Are there other things that you wish you knew in high school and undergrad that you know now and might have changed some of the decisions that you made or impacted your path at all? One I think the biggest one, and I think about this a lot, so I'll just say it again. I already mentioned it, but it would really just be don't underestimate the importance of the social side of music. <clears throat> I know because, and I think this is, it can be difficult as music students. And it was for me, um, it's so easy to just kind of hide in the practice room and because it's a good thing to practice. So I can just go ahead and do that. I don't have to put myself out there. I can just go practice and you kind of become, oh, he's practicing. That's Michael. He's over practicing. He won't be here. Um, I kind of hid behind that, which... Mm. I won't say it didn't benefit my saxophone playing it. I'm sure it did. But if I could do it over again, I would um, put myself out there a little bit more, interact a little bit more um, with my, you know, my peers, especially at the undergrad level. I figured it out. It just took me some time. Um, so don't underestimate that. It's, um, it's just as important as, as practicing, you know, getting to know and appreciate your, your peers uh, is just as important as it is to practice. So um, get out there and enjoy it. If there's a musician right now in somewhere in this education sphere, they're in their undergraduate, master's, doctorate, or maybe they're in this kind of season of gigging and piecing things together, what advice would you have for someone about pivoting into the, the business side of the music industry? Because obviously mm -hmm. it was a big shift for you and it seems like yeah. it was a bit of a surprise. What yeah. do you wish you had known? Um, I think, you know, when you transition into the business world, it's even the music business world, there are certain, some things that are familiar. And then there are other things that you're like, Ooh, I don't know what that term means. I don't know what that, you know, uh, abbreviation means. Um, I had to look up <laughs> yesterday. I was at a call and someone was saying dotted line relationship. And I was like, yeah. I don't know what that means. I'm just going to go to Google really quick. Yep. Like, that's one that's a little out of my territory. It makes sense. But yeah, there's yeah. definitely things you have to learn on the fly. There are. And it Yikes. kind of, it kind of takes you back to being like yeah. an undergrad again, where you're, you're, do I ask this question or is that going to make me, am I going to look stupid? You have, it's easy to doubt yourself. Mm. Um, and now if you're surrounded by the right people, you can overcome that pretty quickly. But I, so my advice <clears throat> would be, Trust your experience um, and, um, you know, try and find somebody that you can trust. If you're fortunate enough to have a mentor figure in the company, fantastic. Don't ever hesitate to ask them questions because they're going to have their best interests in mind for you. Um, especially, you know, if, if I mean, if, if you're a valued employee, which hopefully you are, they're going to have your, your best interest at heart, not only because they care about you, because it also impacts the company in a positive way. So I would just say, um, you know, be prepared to learn new things, keep an open mind, um, and don't be afraid to ask questions. Hmm. That's really good advice, yeah. especially the questions. I think sometimes it feels difficult when you're already vulnerable in a mm -hmm. new position or in a new endeavor to say, I don't know. Yeah. And 
I'm sure in your working environment now as a director of marketing and you're hiring a lot of other musicians that are coming into the mm -hmm. business side of music, you probably encounter this a lot that they're running into the same terms and things that you also weren't aware of. Yeah. Do you find that you respect people more that will just honestly say, I have no idea what you're talking about right now? Can you please clarify? <laughs> I absolutely do. And, um, and I've seen with this with uh, some of the people that I've hired where I'm like, man, you're so much braver than I was, mm. you know? Um, and I really do respect that because the thing is you learn so much faster. If you just ask the question, um, you'll learn so much faster. But I also understand it can, be, it can feel difficult. Um, so it really does come in handy to, to find somebody either in your company or in the industry, um, that you can ask those questions to that you feel comfortable with. So that's what, one of the things that I try to be is that kind of person where you can come and ask me any question. I'm not so far removed from, you know, not being in this industry. Uh, I remember what it was like to come in and realize, okay, I know how to play the saxophone, but I, this is, this part of this <laughs> world is totally new. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's important. It's important to ask those questions and, um, uh, and to, and to find somebody that, you know, can help you along with that. What do you think helped you to grow with Danzer? Cause it's a pretty big jump to go from 20 hours a week, stuff and orders for artists to director yeah. of marketing. I mean, that's massive. What yeah. skills, what approaches, what information, what helped you get there? Well, I was, so a couple, a, a few different things. One of the neat things about where I work, um, with, and our headquarters is in Champaign, Illinois. So I get to work with the accountants. I get to work with the warehouse crew. Um, I get to work with the sales team, the marketing team. Um, so I was exposed early on to like the whole, you know, spectrum of what the company does. Um, so I was able to, I think, pretty quickly gain an understanding of how this relates to that and so on and so forth, which was great. Um, and I, I would say the, the other thing that I mentioned before was I, I was really fortunate to be in the company that I'm in where there are, they are open-minded to questions. They want you to open question or ask them questions. They're happy to take you under their wing. Um, while also respecting that, Oh, he knows stuff that, that we don't know. Mm. Um, so it was kind of that mutual respect, um, and so I had, you know, the president of this, of the company, Michael Skinner, um, he started Danzer 20 years ago, really gutsy move, huge amount of respect for that. Um, also a saxophone player that likes baseball. That's me. So, you know, we had a lot in common there. Um, I feel like, and I, I can ask him just about anything. Um, and then on the sales side, um, same kind of same deal. It's I've I've learned a lot from all of those people that were above me, and and you know the same the same from the people that I'm working with on a day to day basis. Um, I also actually held positions in a lot of these different departments briefly, which was hugely beneficial. So I started on that kind of artist relations, um, just entering orders and offering product advice, which was really comfortable. Um, but I also helped the warehouse for a little bit for about six months, you know, picking orders and all of that kind of stuff um, until they probably decided he was not cut out for this. I don't know. <laughs> but, and then I moved put to the it, sales. Put it back in a cubicle. Just yeah, kidding. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Shut them in the exactly. practice room. Get them out of here. <laughs> I still walk back there and they go, what are you doing here? No. <laughs> It's but, like the uh, office, the, the forklift episode. That's what I'm picturing. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, spinning out of much. control. Yeah, pretty for much. The, no, it was a, it was a, it was the other machine. What was that machine? Do you know what I'm talking about? Not the forklift, um, the compactor or something like that. Anyway, yeah. no, I, I can picture it. I can picture it. <laughs> but, uh, but it was, I mean, all of these positions and I worked on the sales team for a little bit. So I got to know um, the, our VP of sales, who's been, a, you know, at times my, my biggest advocate. And um, I've learned so much from him as well. So it's really been, I've been surrounded by just mm. this incredible team of people and leadership um, that I've just really tried to learn as much, you know, from them as I can and ask as many questions. Um, and also just having those specific positions where I got to really live in their world for a little while. Um, I, I think that helped a lot. That helped a lot for me to understand kind of what it takes to succeed in this spot versus that spot, how we can work better together maybe than we have been in the past. Um, 
So yeah, all of that. Again, it's about just keeping an open mind and not becoming, you know, don't try and avoid that tunnel vision. Um, there's a time and place for that, but you got to gotta look left and right sometimes too. That makes total sense. Thank you for sharing all of that. I think this yeah. is so helpful and I've really enjoyed all these, these tidbits that you have. I know there are probably things that you share on a pretty regular basis, but not, not all together all the time. So I, I'm loving hearing kind of all aspects yeah. of your work and your journey. I do um, want to zoom out for music a little bit. So we mentioned baseball is one of yeah. our other yeah. interests. What other like fixations? What other things are you super into right now? Like outside of work, yeah. what is Michael doing? All right. So um, I've got two kids, a five-year-old girl and a seven-year-old boy. And they obviously keep me very busy. We have a blast, whether it's dance parties or, you know, playing catch in the yard or oh, breaking up fights, whatever it might be. We have a good time. <laughs> Are they both in music also? Are they taking any lessons? So, uh, so my daughter is in dance right ah. now. Um, my son is, uh, he just started drum lessons and he did I take a year of pray piano. for your eardrums. Oh my yes. goodness. Have yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah. We're, well, we're lucky. We've got a basement and he's got a little setup down there and it, nice. it's going, it's going well. Oh, uh, he took funny. a year of piano and my wife is actually a general music teacher and beginning band director. So there's a lot of music stuff that we do <laughs> around the house for sure. That's um, so fun. So yeah, so that's, I mean, that's the bulk of it for me. <laughs> I still gig, you know, when I can and, and when I want, but right now I'm really outside of work, at least at this phase of my life, it's mostly about my family. Um, but I am a huge Chicago Cubs fan looking forward to this next season. They got to get some things together, but I think, you know, it could be there. Uh, and then some little smaller things that I enjoy. I really like cooking. Mm. Um, I'm hoping to do more of that with my kids. My, nice. my, I, I think, you know, I kind of see a little bit of an interest in them when I'm, you know, whipping stuff up. Um, and Are there any daughter, specific like styles of cooking that you gravitate towards? Well, if it were up to me, I would just make Italian food of some sort almost every night. Fair but, enough. You know, there's a, a variety of, of uh, culinary interests in my house. So we got to, you know, <laughs> go beyond that. But uh, yeah. And then I, I enjoy, I have a little garden in the summertime that I really love that. And my daughter enjoys doing that with me. So oh, it's a lot of family stuff and, you know, finding the little things that, you know, just kind of make, make me and us happy. So. That's wonderful. And you said you are still playing just kind of here and there. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that's something that's ebbs and flows a little bit in your life? I mean, COVID mucked yeah. that whole thing up. So that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. But Well, the funny thing was I, so before COVID, right before I had quit teaching privately, I had only, mm -hmm. I was down to just a, a handful of students and, and I, and my kids were really little and I said, something's got to give. I, I can't keep teaching and playing as much as I was and yeah. working full time. So I said, all right, I'll, I'm going to kind of let these students go and then I'll, I'll be able to play a little bit more. And then COVID happened. <laughs> the, the gigs were nowhere. That's good. Unfortunately, would, oh no. Yeah. yeah. So Aww. that was kind of, kind of funny, but, um, but uh, prior to COVID, I, was, I would have two or three gigs a month and that, that was good. I felt like, you know, from a life balance perspective, I was still feeling like a musician and um, still, you know, with my family as much and keeping up with work and all of that. Um, and then after COVID, I, I don't know if my kids just started getting, you know, keeping me even more busy or if I had just kind of fallen off the horse a little bit, but I haven't quite, I haven't been gigging as much since COVID, but it's, you know, a lot of that, it's just a personal choice. And I think that's something that, Sometimes people will ask about work-life balance and mm -hmm. all of that. And I, I think it's just something that we all figure out as we, as we go. And right now, um, my top priorities are my family and then my job. Um, because without either one of those, my life would just, I mean, I can't imagine life without either of those. So, and then, but a very close third comes, you know, the, um, making sure I'm still a musician myself. So, It'll, it does come in waves. There will be some months where I, I don't play, I don't have any gigs, but maybe I'm just practicing at home. Um, and then others where suddenly I've got all kinds of work, maybe even more than I really wanted. Um, but uh, Fair yeah, enough. and that's okay. That's okay. 
That's awesome. Yeah, with two in elementary school, it starts to get a little chaotic on the the after school activities and the driving and the, oh, the homework yeah. and all those things. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's, it's great though. Sometimes. It's great. That's yeah. that's amazing. Oh, I'm mm-hmm. so glad, Michael. This has been just a wonderful conversation, and I really appreciate you sharing so much insight and so many ideas. Thank you again for your time. Oh, thanks for having me. This has been a blast. I really appreciate it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm.